Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is Paul Sims speaking to you from IFA Pharma offices in London. Thank you so much for being here on time. Um, we've got a really exciting webinar here for you today. Um, I'm pleased to announce that uh, we're going to be talking about delivering digital endpoints, as you can hopefully see on your screen in front of you. Find new outcomes fast and fulfill the promise of technology in trials. So uh, I think this is an absolutely critical uh, session. Um, we've got uh, nearly a thousand people registered, so clearly uh, of value to many of you. Uh, and really uh, the rationale, shall we say, for, for putting on this session is because um, we've talked for, for a long time about the various different mobile wearable implantable technologies that can passively, continuously collect data from our body over months and years, can actually has the potential to really transform clinical research and our understanding of health. Um, but of course, it's still not as easy as we all might have dreamed. Uh, despite the existence of tools, Apple's research kits, many different devices, uh, obviously a lot of ubiquity of those devices in, in terms of personal ownership and really a, an order of magnitude more data coming from those devices, these digital endpoints remain somewhat slow to gain wide adoption they are underutilized and they are still very difficult to set up and create in a reliable way. So we need to find ways to make that easier. We need to find ways to choose the technology, collect, analyze and interpret that data, ensure the authenticity and the quality of that data, maintain confidentiality and privacy concerns, ensure that our protocols are designed uh, according in, in the first place to the right ways of collecting this data and of course being able to satisfy regulators many many different uh, stakeholders many many different things to try and uh, keep in mind when doing this successfully so the aim of today's session is to gain some real practical know-how and bringing these digital endpoints online as quickly as we can i'm also going to use it because we've got a good audience i'm also going to use this webinar as an opportunity to ask you guys, the audience, quite a few questions. I think um, by surveying um, the, the audience that we have today, we're gonna get some useful data on where we are as an industry, what the key beliefs are, what the key challenges are that we uh, most commonly find, and therefore, I hope, what some of the solutions might be that we need to pursue going forwards. Now, you'll be pleased to know that I am not going to attempt this on my own. I am joined by uh, five, other than uh, myself, five uh, very capable people who know a lot about this area. So let me just introduce them very quickly. Uh, so we have Carrie, uh, top left. Uh, she has a diverse uh, scientific background in pharmacology, toxicology, physiology. She's actually been an academic for many, many years, um, but uh, most recently has been with Pfizer actually for um, a few years now as well. Um, she's providing unique insight into understanding how digital endpoints provide meaningful information to patients, doctors, and researchers to better treat and understand underlying conditions. She's actually heading up a team to evaluate and validate the use of wearable digital devices to more fully understand physiological endpoints. I believe she's working particularly in the area of sleep at the moment and some really interesting stuff going on there. So thank you, Carrie, for joining us. Uh, under Carrie, you'll see Kate. Now, Kate is from VivaSense, and Kate actually has a wide array of different uh, research interests and experiences from connected and mobile health technology to uh, various studies of physical activity, sedentary behavior and sleep and risk of chronic disease, metabolism, and of course, using mobile technology as a tool to actually motivate and direct health behavior change. Uh, and she's done that in both clinical, academic, and industry settings. Uh, and she's even got degrees in kinesiology and applied physiology. So really fantastic um, that she can be with us. I also want to say a particular thanks to VivoSense, uh, where she works. Uh, and Kate and VivoSense have been a great partner to actually uh, make this webinar happen in the first place. Uh, and they've been an excellent partner to work with throughout and indeed have helped us uh, gather such a good audience today. So particular thanks to, to Viva Sense and Kate. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the company, I do suggest that you take a deeper look. Uh, but we'll hear a bit more from Kate in a moment. She's going to present a few slides to kick us off. Uh, under Kate is Yelena. She is a data scientist at Novartis. Um, her, she describes her background as somewhat strange because she came from electrical engineering and did a PhD in biomedical engineering. Um, and she says that she's really found a calling 
that combines her background in helping people with developing digital endpoints and signs from wearable devices and sensors. It's really a dream job. So I'm very pleased that you can uh, express the passion for your dream job here today, Elena, and really pleased that you can join us. She does a lot of work with medical professionals to define what can be measured and how best to help patients. Uh, Erasmus is a name you may have recognized if you've been looking at the IFAM Awards as himself at Leo was a recent recipient and uh, in general I believe personally that the Leo Innovation Lab is one of the most exciting parts of our industry for a few years now has been doing some really sterling work in actually pushing the needle um, and it's actually you know really quite quite impressive that they're doing this um, within the confines of a pharma company although obviously at arm's length from the mothership of Leo um, Rasmus himself has extensive experience in pharma, in marketing, our market access, HUR project management, and site optimization and study setup. Um, he's actually specifically focused on virtual clinical trials, as you'll see with his job title. He's got a Master of Medical Sciences, and uh, as he was just saying before we went online, he's very much a startup guy. He's more of an entrepreneurial uh, bent than, than, than with the uh, traditional corporate surroundings, and uh, I'm hoping that at Leo he's getting the chance to uh, wear both hats there. Uh, I'm personally very excited about some of the work coming out of Leo. Uh, Ray is, uh, Dr. Ray Dorsey is the Professor of Neurology and Director of the Center for Health and Technology at the University of Rochester. Uh, and he has been responsible for actually creating a journal on digital endpoints. He's used creative technology to uh, enable anyone anywhere to receive care, participate in research and benefit from therapeutic advances and very much at the cutting edge of a lot of the work here we're doing in telemedicine, uh, lots of work in movement disorders and neurology. He's worked at McKinsey as a consultant. Uh, he's done work at John Hopkins uh, worked, uh, and he's featured in a lot of uh, major publications as well. So. Overall, I think you can agree with me that we couldn't wish for a better panel to really focus on this this, this topic, and uh, that's indeed what we're going to do. So, um, what I'd really like you guys to do at this point is to take a look at the right-hand side of your screen, where you will see a little questions box, and perhaps you can uh, indicate that you're uh, still listening to me, haven't fallen asleep yet and say a little hello to me there, uh, and that way I can ensure that you are indeed hearing me. Thank you very much. I can see the hellos coming in. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, now that you've uh, found this box, please use it throughout. Um, we want today's session to be interactive, a discussion rather than uh, a didactic session, so make sure you get your personal issues and questions answered by being as active as you possibly can be in this questions box. So. Um, yes, Jasper, questions box, that is right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, so um, let's go straight into actually asking you as an audience a poll question. So if you look at your screen right now, you will see a question pop up. And that question is, at what stage would you say you currently are at when it comes to this topic? So you've obviously got five different uh, options there, advanced, good, pilot, intended, or basic. Um, Hopefully you can answer this one relatively quickly and off the cuff, as I don't want to hold it for too long. Um, where do you personally believe your organization to be? Obviously, if you're not working for a pharma company, then try and speak on behalf of your clients uh, and let me know what you think. So I'll hold that open three more seconds. Three, two, one. Here we go. Right. What are the results? Well. Um, middling, I would say. Um, a bit of a normal distribution, although still 21% of people at the basic level. Only 7% describe themselves as advanced, and clearly the majority of us in the good pilot stage. Probably not a huge surprise, but uh, that's where we as an industry personally believe ourselves to be. So thank you very much to all of those who voted just there. Uh, let's do one more of these questions before I hand over to Kate. So have a look at this one. What would you say is the greatest barrier this time? So um, I would love to know what's holding you back. Uh, is it the limited awareness of potential uh, and uh, uh, you know, simply not being, uh, as an organization, aware of what can be done in this area? Is it a lack of senior level buy-in or support, or perhaps you're not getting the funding that you require to actually do what you want to do? Is it a lack of capabilities, expertise? Uh, can't find it either internally or externally. Is it high costs, other financial barriers, 
or finally a feared lack of acceptance by regulators. Uh, you don't know if they're going to be aligned with you. You haven't necessarily done all the work necessary with the regulators to determine if they're going to be accepting of what you're working on. Okay, about half of you have voted so far, clearly the good half. Uh, I will hold it open three more seconds. Three, two, one. Thank you very much. Got most of you in there. That's great. Let's have a look at the results. Okay, um, interesting. Bit of a bit of a variation here. So 21% say they're simply not aware. Hopefully this webinar will help with that. Um, 33, that's the winner, on lack of capabilities, expertise. Uh, and uh, clearly, we need to uh, improve, uh, improve there. But uh, I think that that's a a work in progress. And then finally, a, over a quarter of you saying the feared lack of acceptance by regulators. Uh, interested to hear? Maybe you can write into the questions box on whether you believe that that is genuine. Of course, regulators have been a little more uh, forthcoming of late, and um, I can see that they're very much um, trying to work with us on this front. Uh, but perhaps. Uh, you've got a, a, a point to make on this on this one, in which case, please do share it with us. Okay, as promised, I'm going to hand over to Kate now, uh, who's going to uh, really set the scene um, with a few more uh, slides. And uh, Kate, if you can accept that, then I can switch screens. Kate, are you there? I am. I'm Can you try uh, sharing that again, Paul? Uh, has it not worked? I will try once again. Oh, it's not giving me the option to do so. So it's, it's uh, definitely on your side that you need to uh, accept it, Kate. I, I don't have, Paul, uh, an accept window okay very strange I'm going to bring it back to myself which mm -hmm. hopefully has happened and uh, I uh, will try once again apologies to everybody there it goes okay Got it. there we go perfect okay over to you then Kate go for it All right. Well, thanks, Paul, and good morning or good afternoon to all of our panelists and attendees, depending on where everyone is joining from. I'm really excited to have the opportunity today to participate in what should be a really great and exciting discussion. So as Paul said, I'm going to present some slides for about 10 to 15 minutes to kind of set the stage for the discussion. Um, before I get started, I wanted to take a moment and um, just introduce VivoSense um, to those of you who may not be familiar with who we are. Um, so we describe ourselves as a data analytics consulting and software company that specializes in wearable sensor physiological monitoring solutions for research and clinical trials. So in essence, we function as a core lab for data from wearable sensors, and we strive to partner in all aspects of handling these data from clinical study design, including sensor selection and protocol development and customized data analytics, um, to a robust data quality control. And we do this all within the highest data regulatory security um, compliance standards possible. Um, so it's no secret to any of us in attendance today that the landscape of clinical trials and drug discovery is changing. That's why we're all here, right? Um, one very general description of how clinical trials are changing is that they're becoming increasingly more complex in all aspects. And this is particularly relevant to the way that studies are designed. So um, these data here on the right are from a report published in 2000, 2018 by the Tuff Center for the Study of Drug Development. And they reported that from 2002 to 2012, the number of end, endpoints um, included in clinical trials included increased 86 percent, um, while the number of um, procedures that a participant or patient has to undergo um, as part of a clinical trial has increased 58 percent. Um, the number of eligibility criteria is up 61 percent, and the amount of data that we collect on patients is astronomical, with over 900,000 data points being collected over the course of a trial. 
Um, but despite this increasing complexity, um, our success rate is still extremely low. Um, the report um, uh, reports that only about one in 10 phase one drugs make it to the market. And the cost of doing this is somewhere around $2.6 billion. And I'm sorry. And so while wearables and other um, connected technologies can certainly be contributing to this increasing complexity and increasing cost at the present moment, there's no denying that their pot potential to enable patient-centric um, trials and improve financial and scientific efficiency and ultimately produce better health outcomes for patients um, is high. There's a lot of enthusiasm in the field for the use of these tools in clinical trials. And so um, in a survey conducted by uh, the company Validic in 2016, they reported that 64% of respondents are currently using digital um, in trials and a whopping 97% reported that they intend to use digital more in trials over the next five years. And so the figure on the right kind of breaks down um, the use of digital by the different technology type. And what we can see in this figure is that the rate of use of um, technologies currently being used um, is highest among mobile applications, as well as in-home clinical grade um, devices such as glucometers, um, continuous glucose monitors, or blood pressure cuffs. Um, but over the next five years, the growth that we'll see in this area will be predominantly due to wearable activity trackers or other types of sensors such as injectable um, sensors or sensor-enabled pill um, bottles. Um, but it, when I consult clinicaltrials.com, um, this sentiment um, for enthusiasm isn't quite um, reflected as what these reports suggest. So in 2019, the end of 2019 in December, I conducted um, a pretty thorough inventory of all the studies using wearables or reporting using wearables um, to define an endpoint um, in their study. And the table on the right breaks it down by um, FDA regulated early phase to phase four trials and then um, non FDA regulated and observational trials. And what you can see here is that the majority of um, the studies using digital or connected technologies fall within this non FDA regulated um, uh, group or observational group. And in fact, only eight of the FDA regulated trials. Um, use a connected technology or wearable sensor to define a primary endpoint. And most of these studies were um, studies that use a combination of an approved drug with a new therapy such as a behavioral intervention um, or exercise or something like that. And in fact, I was only able to find one study um, for certain that used a connected technology to define a prime one, a sole primary endpoint, um, and that was a study that VivoSense was um, uh, participated in doing the analytics for in a regulated trial on Rett syndrome. And while this search for connected and wearable technologies on clinicaltrials.gov is certainly imperfect, um, we can describe these technologies in a number of different ways. So it is possible that I missed um, some studies here. I think that the point is is that. The enthusiasm is high, but the actual use of them uh, remains low at the moment. And so um, how do we achieve success? How do we begin to actually use these tools in trials? The barriers, barriers to using them are no longer around the technology that's currently available. There are a lot of readily available clinical grade technologies that we can use. Um, the challenge to us as a field right now is developing new processes and methods that can effectively use these technologies. And so this image here on the left is from the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, and it nicely illustrates the distinct areas of clinical trials um, that warrant specific consideration in order to be able to effectively apply um, technologies within clinical trials. And so each of these areas 
is loaded with um, nuances and technical um, considerations um, that we need to take into account uh, as we develop the methods. But I thought for today, I would just highlight four overarching and interrelated principles that we um, at VivoSense um, consider extremely important when we're developing methods to use technologies in clinical trials. And that is first that everything is hypothesis driven. Um, one size does not fit all, good data over big data. And of course, all of this needs to be done while holding data security, quality, um, and integrity to the highest standards. And so I thought um, I would provide a little bit of context to these principles. I would give some examples from the RET trial um, that I referenced earlier. And so while we think that um, when we think of defining clinical meaningful endpoints and selecting sensors to measure these clinical meaningful endpoints, the fact that they should be this step should be hypothesis driven seems um, quite obvious, but it's not uncommon at this stage of the game to see that we actually see um, instances where the readily available technology is dictating um, what clinical meaningful endpoints we're interested in or even what our um, research question may be. So for example, in Rett syndrome, um, Rett syndrome causes severe breathing abnormalities um, in young girls, and these breathing abnormalities tend to occur while um, patients are awake. And when they're asleep, uh, their breathing returns to near normal. Um, but yet, if we look at trials conducted in RET, we often see um, breathing abnormalities such as apneas measured during night using a PSG um, system. And so this is an instance where the technology available um, has dictated that they're gonna measure nighttime apneas um, versus daytime apneas. So in this trial, we knew that we wanted to measure um, breathing abnormalities, apneas, and hyperventilations that occur during the wake. And so we needed to identify um, a sensor, an, an appropriate sensor that could measure these things in a population of young girls that are often uh, immobile. And so in collaboration with the sponsor and, key, and a key opinion leader in the field, we identified um, a respiratory device that could be used um, in this population, um, we chose to use a respiratory inductive plethysmography device that consists of um, respiration bands over the chest and over the abdomen. And this picture here um, shows a little girl wearing um, the respiratory band sensors, which are sewn into this shirt that she's wearing. Um, and the schematic on the right just represents how the sensors are placed. Um, And so one size does not fit all. What do we mean by this? Um, and so when I say this, mostly what I'm referring to is algorithm development and testing. Um, it's most likely that um, we're able to look to um, the literature, look to academic resources, that sort of thing, to identify um, algorithms that may be relevant for our research question on hand. Um, but it's most likely that these methods will need to be adjusted or optimized um, for the population that we are interested in studying. And so in the example of Rett syndrome, um, we were able to find um, algorithms in the literature uh, based off of uh, respiratory sensors over the rib cage um, and over the abdomen. But these needed to be adjusted and tweaked to our population that we are interested in studying. And so the way that we did this was we collected a small um, data set with ground truth um, labeled um, and integrated with the output from the sensor. And we were able to develop and test algorithms using this small um, ground truth labeled data set. And so this idea of one size fits all um, is very closely um, related to this concept of good data over big data. And when we have the ability to collect continuous data for days to weeks at a time, big data analytics are undoubtedly tempting. Um, and certainly they may have their place um, somewhere along the lines. Um, but at this stage of the game, when we're still trying to pin down the nuances of using these technologies in specific clinical groups, 
the benefit of smaller data sets labeled with ground truth and clean to remove unwanted sensor artifact that's sometimes an issue from real world data um, cannot be underestimated. And I think at this stage of the game, these sorts of data sets are extremely um, valuable. And so because we prioritize data security and integrity every step of the way, um, we need to implement systems that um, can track and audit uh, the data from the raw um, signals all the way up to the processed reports um, that we send to the FDA. This is not something that's trivial and easily done, and so developing streamlined approaches to doing this, um, I think will benefit and um, really be a resource when we are uh, approaching the FDA and seeking regulatory approval. And so I just wanted to um, revisit this idea of one size fits all um, really quickly and using an example from real world accelerometry data. There's a lot of interest right now in using wearable accelerometers to measure characteristics of gait in different clinical populations. And there are quite a few algorithms that are published in the literature to do this. Um, and the figure on the right here kind of exemplifies this one size does not fit all. On the top, we have um, a normal healthy gait. Um, and then we compare that to four um, distinct clinical manifestations of impaired gait. And you can see that the footfall pattern for each of these um, clinical manifestations is quite different. And so you could imagine that an algorithm designed to estimate steps or to characterize gait in a healthy individual may not work so well in each of these different clinical groups. So again, we can use the algorithms published on healthy individuals as a starting point um, to begin our process of developing and adapting for certain clinical groups. Um, and so while the landscape of clinical trials is clearly in, in flux, we do now have the technology um, that is capable of taking clinical trials out of the clinic and into patients where real world um, environment. So the benefits of this real world evidence that we're able to collect using these technologies are well documented. Um, but we at VivoSense, we believe that there are several key components to building and analyzing and interpreting these contextually rich real world data sets. Um, the first being that when possible, we should collect continuous measurements. And being able to collect data for days to weeks at a time is extremely valuable. Um, and then we can add context to these continuous measurements um, by integrating data from multiple behavioral or physiological sensors. And in addition to these physiological and behavioral sensors, we can include patient reported outcomes, EPRO or ECOA. Um, and because these are new, um, uh, very complex, detailed, data sets, um, we need to use clever or um, appropriate data visualization tools to really interpret our data and gain the most insight from them. And when we do this, um, we will we'll be able to get a complete picture of disease manifestation in a patient's real world environment. We'll be able to use these data to identify clinically meaningful events that potentially occur um, intermittently as a opposed to uh, when we use kind of snapshot assessments in a clinic, um, it's likely that we'll miss some important um, clinical events that occur on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but measuring continuously, we'll be able to look at um, between day and within day variation for an individual. We'll be able to much more, um, uh, we'll be in a much better position to assess disease progression and also understand symptom management in the real world. And so to finish up, I wanted to leave you with a few kind of examples of uh, the potential of using these devices um, in the real world. So this figure here um, shows real world posture and stepping data collected continuously for 11 months using a wearable accelerometer. Each line on the x-axis is one day of behavior with hours spent sitting shown in the yellow below the x-axis. 
um, an hour spent standing in green and stepping in red. Um, and so the continuous nature of these data is interesting. There's clearly a lot of information here um, that we can uh, derive uh, from this continuous me measurement beyond um, simply reporting, for example, average steps per day, which is commonly done. But we can take these data a step further, um, and when we express these exact same data in a little bit more meaningful visualization, we can derive even deeper insights. So the figure on the left shows these data in a spiral as opposed to the traditional X, Y coordinates. Um, each ring of the spiral represents a day of the week, um, with midnight um, being shown at the top of the spiral and midday noon at the bottom. And so when we express these data like this, we see we're able to see that this um, participant uh, has a pretty consistent wake up routine where they get up around 7 a.m. every morning. They have a short period of about 30, 20 to 30 minutes of stepping, followed by some standing, stepping again. There's a quite prominent midday walk. Um, and then in the evening, there's also another prominent um, walk, although not quite as consistent as the midday walk. But this sort of insight was not possible when we expressed the data um, as shown on the previous slide. And we can even express um, these data by days of the week. So this figure on the right shows activity um, by day of the week. And what we see here is that this person's behavior is quite consistent from Monday through Friday. They have a morning peak of activity, a midday peak of activity, and again, an evening peak of activity. But on Saturday and Sunday, um, this pattern does not um, follow through. And so um, my last example here um, is using real world um, blood glucose data combined with um, patient reported outcomes. And so the figure in the bottom right here shows seven days of blood glucose measured using, using a continuous glucose uh, monitoring device. Um, and we can clearly see the day-to-day -day fluctuations and we can look at um, uh, how, how blood glucose um, varies within this individual. When we zoom in on the day, we can see, um, you know, we can see uh, different patterns in the data and we can identify clinically meaningful events such as time in hyper or hypoglycemia. Um, but then if we take this a step further and start to annotate it with patient reported outcomes, we can get a lot more context um, from these data. So in the gray here is sleep and the yellow is wake. Um, and we can start to build a much better understanding of this person's uh, metabolic physiology. Um, here I've annotated um, a, eating events in the brown, which is energy intake. And then we have insulin administration, long acting in the green, and short acting insulin administration in the orange. And then we also have um, exercise or energy expenditure highlighted in the blue. Um, and so the point here is that by measuring these potential confounding variables that also imp impact blood glucose, whether it's via self-report or another sensor such as an activity tracker, um, these types of data are crucial in any efficacy trial that's um, studying the effect of a glucose lowering medication, as well as for developing comprehensive clinician directed strategies for lowering um, blood glucose or obtaining gly glycemic control. Um, and it's important because these other factors are, are modifiable, so we can take this into our plan and our consideration. Um, and so, Adding this context, again, just allows us to um, derive much more better understanding of the data and to um, hopefully impact patient outcomes um, in the long term. So with that, I will um, turn it back over to Paul and um, go from there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Really appreciate that. Um, we've got some uh, audience questions, and I'm sure we've got a few few uh, other comments to make. So I'm just going to uh, read out a, a few of these, if that's OK. And uh, you can have a go, if that's all right, Kate. Uh, maybe some others want to chip in as well. So uh, Rosalind, hello, Rosalind. Uh, good to hear from you. She says, uh, how and when are patients and families included in the development process of the 
devices and, and obviously the software, etc., on the devices, uh, e.g. the Rett syndrome example. Um, Jasper says, although one size doesn't fit all, do you see a common theme of when to consider digital endpoints? For example, in CNS studies, CLIN ROs are incorporated. When should we consider digital endpoints in our protocol? Uh, and Sunil Soni says, can a validated digital endpoint still carry a risk that it does not correctly or accurately represent how the patient feels, behaves, and functions? And if yes, what might be the proportion of risk B, or where is the uncertainty? So I think I'll uh, hold back on asking any more, otherwise it'll be information overload. Do you want to tackle any of those, Kate? And uh, does anyone else want to chip in? Sure. So I'll, I'll um, uh, start with the question about the Rett syndrome and when when do we involve patients in the development of the devices and the technology. And so, so for us in that example, we had a small trial, like I said, that we collected ground truth data and um, we use clinicians and clinician oversight to do this. And as part of that process, we included um, patient and caregiver um, feedback of whether or not the patients would wear these devices in their real world um, environment. And of course, that's a key step in deciding which um, technology to use. Obviously, if a patient isn't going to use the technology, then there's no use um, in choosing that technology, no matter how good the data are that you um, get from them. Thanks. Anyone else want to contribute? Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to elaborate related to this kind of one thing fits all. Um, basically, we did a study at Leo Lab where we actually did, in a, did a study where we collected passive data, where we obviously know that UV index uh, and pollution humidity has a huge effect in dermatology. What we saw was actually that in these cases, patients, even though that they were exposed in Denmark, where it's some kind of hojemas, basically they have different kind of ways to have an effect. So basically people could actually have a pass a signature voice uh, to, to the treatment that they were receiving and basically also having a, some kind of false placebo effect. So I totally agree with you, Kate, to, to actually go in and say we should pay very much attention to collecting data and collecting good data instead of just big data. And Thanks, I can add something that this is Carrie. Um, yes, the patient is extremely important, um, as Kate stated very eloquently. That it, you know, it's key to understand whether they will wear the device and it's comfortable, etc. But it's also very important that you validate and verify that the device is capturing what you want to ca capture, as well as the sensitivity and specificity of those devices in capturing that specific measure. So having those ground truth comparisons and those grounds. Um, experiments is very key as as they questioned a person's feeling of uh, emotional state or feeling with regards to like a PRO how are you feeling may be different than the endpoint you're actually measuring because they may feel tired and, and express that as a, a feeling however when you actually look at a digital measure um, you're actually looking at a quantifiable measure and you understand that uh, quantitative value, and they may be different. So those are things you have to keep in mind as you approach these in uh, various studies. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, I uh, uh, oh, actually, does Rasmus, do you want to contribute on the the, the one size fits all thing, or have we already covered that? Well, well, well not more. You know, I would like to present it in Barcelona as well. But but I really believe that that we, 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 when we do this, you know, we should pay very much attention to collaborate across industry. So that would be the pharmaceutical, biotech, tech, but also involving the, the the patient in itself. You know, because we know there are so many things and aspects that needs to be included, not only from a validation perspective, because even though that the 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 you know variable is validated correctly. If the patients do not want to bear it, basically we are back to ground zero, you know. So, so, uh, so, yeah. Okay, I want to go to one of the the audience questions, which um, which was was actually asked, and ask this to the whole audience. So, if you look at your screen once again, uh, a very simple question here: At what development phase do you believe digital biomarkers will be most heavily adopted? Now, of course. The answer, of course, is going to be it depends, and it depends on many, many different factors. But I'm asking you to generalize here, uh, and I'm just interested to know where you think that this will, will be most likely to occur. 
uh, and I can see uh, people are voting. That's great. So you've got larger phase three trials, phase two, phase one, or safety studies, or pilot stage only. So uh, give me your opinions. I can see half of you have voted. I'll hold it open another three, three, two, one. And I can see there's going to be a strong winner here. So let's see. Nearly two-fifths of you saying larger phase three, um, uh, but significant minorities on all of the others. Uh, so hopefully that is of interest. Um, I did mention that I was going to do a few of these, so I'm going to do um, another one. And uh, just interested again in where you feel that um, the most benefit is going to be used, uh, most benefit is going to occur. So what disease types and indications do you believe will benefit most from these biomarkers going forward? Cardiorespiratory, neurological or cognitive impairment, movement disorders and functional impairment, sleep and diabetes and metabolic conditions. I realize I'm being very tough on you, allowing you to choose only one of these each time. Um, it's uh, very much forcing you to choose which one you believe will be most. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will see good results because there's quite a lot of people on the line. Uh, okay, that's good. I've got the alert half of you once again. So three, two, one. Thank you very much, everyone. And the results of this one are as follows. Um, slightly more even spread, but definitely not sleep. Sorry, uh, sorry, those of you focusing on sleep, and I know two of our panelists are. Um, but uh, the movement that perhaps uh, something that uh, Kate was obviously talking about just, just then, being a very strong winner, um, and 20% uh, really for all of the rest. So, so that gives you a, perhaps no no huge surprises there, but uh, always good to see. Uh, always good to see, nonetheless. Uh, I think I'll do one more of these questions for the time being, uh, and then we'll go back into our discussion. So um, this one is sort of related to the last one, but this time I'm talking about the type of digital data. So which types of digital data do you think will be the most impactful in the next 18 months for the development of new treatments? Is it long-term continuous data to, to replace periodic assessments? Is it real-world setting data to replace clinical setting data? Is it objective data to replace subjective data, so having uh, uh, a lot more uh, certainty there? Uh, or is it real-time data to replace offline analytics, so being able to analyze on the fly and hopefully make decisions on the fly? So interested to know which of these you think will be most prevalent or at least certainly what the most greatest increase will be coming forward. Three more seconds. Three Two, one, let's have a look. So thank you, everybody. <clears throat> okay, this time we've got another winner. Nearly 40% of people on real-world setting data to replace clinical setting data. So a lot of people feel that that will not necessarily substitute, but certainly complement uh, our clinical data. Um, interesting that the others are slightly less, although none of them, I would say, are total losers. Um, only 13% on the real time, so that's of slightly less interest to us. Okay, I'd really like uh, to involve um, the remainder of our panel who haven't had much chance to talk as yet. Uh, ask them to comment if there's anything interesting that they found on these uh, polls that I've been conducting, uh, or indeed if you'd like to add or emphasize anything that, uh, that Kate mentioned, or uh, share some of your own experience in actually getting this. Where have things gone wrong for you? Where have things gone right? So who wants to contribute a little on that front? Don't all shout at once. <laughs> no, well, I, I would like to, you know, but but basically, you know, I'm always talking, so so I'm trying to mute. Uh, but but basically, what, what, <laughs> uh, we're very much interested in this kind of sleep behavior and also quality of sleep due to that uh, in dermatology, we know that people are, are you know, scratching, itching, you know. Uh, but what we are very focused on is actually capturing high quality pictures which we can actually use for clinical assessments. Uh, and likewise, what I would like to present in Barcelona is also the correlations between a remote uh, assessment in person assessment you know and what we actually found out that it's actually achievable to actually do uh, equal and correlation between a remote uh, assessment due to uh, the score out and the um, and TIS as well so um, so yeah so I would like to include dermatology in that setting for our next presentation so Paul I think there is uh, just on the questions, I think when to be adopted, I would encourage people to think about adopting it earlier. Um, clinical trials largely broken down into two different 
purposes. One is to learn and the second is to confirm. And so learning is done in the earlier stage and confirming in the, in the later stage. And most of these markers have, most of these digital sensors have not been uh, extensively evaluated in clinical studies. And Pfizer, for example, has evaluated these things even before putting them into clinical trials, because there's a lot of learning uh, to be done, both on the feasibility, what works well, what doesn't work well, what data are most useful, what are participants uh, most interested in doing. So I, I actually would encourage people to think about using them uh, most in the early stages, and then once they figured out what's valuable in the early stage and how to work with them to incorporate them in later stages. Second is, you know, what diseases, I think the diseases for which uh, these digital endpoints are most valuable are those for which our current measures stink. Uh, so no one's talking about using digital endpoints to measure hypercholesterolemia or hypertension because we can generally do that fairly well, though hypertension is not optimal. Um, but, you know, for like lots of neurological disorders or psychiatric disorders, you know, we have antiquated scales that we use to assess depression. We use happy faces to measure pain in 2020. We use uh, terrible measures uh, for uh, park, not terrible for Parkinson's, you know, very suboptimal scales for Parkinson's, disease, which we have people tap their thumb and index finger and measure that on the episodic or a subjective rating scale that goes from zero to four. And then the last question was about uh, replacing uh, current measures. I would say in the near term, these things are going to be used to supplement uh, current measures, not to not to replace them. Longer term, many of these digital measures, just like imaging, might be used to supplant what's currently in place. But I would uh, think that in the near term, that these are going to be used as supplemental uh, measures to help uh, pharma companies, for example, determine whether their drug or device is effective or not. Thank you, Ray. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Yelena, we haven't heard much from you yet. Please, please give us a bit more of your insights, if that's possible. Exactly, exactly. I would agree here with Ray, actually, that uh, neuroscience will uh, will uh, profit maybe the most or the soonest because the <laughs> the, the standard measures are are not not very good. <clears throat> uh, but uh, but yeah, these questions were really difficult. So I would say maybe uh, that. Uh, more uh, maybe objective measures would be uh, even though it was in the third place uh, at the vote uh, would be would replace subjective maybe Carrie also can uh, can comment on that I mean in sleep uh, uh, replacing a simple wearable device uh, replacing a uh, I mean a diary sleep diary with a device with objective measures it's fairly easy and it's uh, mature uh, right now right Yes, okay. we're in a place now that we can do that, where we can provide some of that uh, with the digital wearables, provide that quantitative passive measurement that won't necessarily be influenced by how your day was, et cetera. Understanding how a patient feels is clearly very important. However, having that subjective measure is so key, like Ray commented, just a single snapshot just doesn't necessarily provide the context for both the clinicians to provide the best care, and then it doesn't uh, work for the patient either, no matter what condition you're in. So um, I think there's a great use of the digital as we move forward in that space. Thank you. Okay, we're getting some really great audience questions in. Please do keep them rolling and we'll get to as many of them we can. Um, I just want to uh, focus on a question that uh, my friend Kai Langle has uh, sent in. Hello, Kai. Um, he asks, how do we ensure that our industry doesn't start competing on endpoints? In other words, uh, you know, finding different ones and trying to uh, uh, Beat the competition with with our own uh, our own favorites. You know how how can we align on this front? How can we compete instead on product performance and uh, uh, perform those gold standards? And I know that this is something that Kai is going to uh, present on himself in Barcelona, but very keen to hear panelist opinions. Well, I can start. You know, uh, once again, a great question from Kai. Um, I totally agree. What what actually amuses me is actually that we see more and more cross industry collaboration across, you know. So basically what we will see here also from a regulatory perspective is actually that we are streamlining how we actually designing the protocols and in terms of that also streamlining the endpoints. So I don't think that we will see uh, people competing, but I really believe that we will see people some kind of pioneering in the field and maybe doing what they do best and then we can benefit from that. 
Yes, I think uh, also that uh, that we are we are in a unique position here. Uh, we are uh, like techies uh, in the pharma industry, right? So this is not the core business of pharma; it's molecules, right? So there is uh, almost no competition among us. So we are all working towards the same goals, uh, right? So I think this is uh, the, the collaborating on data and sharing data and, and uh, in, in this digital space is, is really really good. Okay, great. Um, I that, thank you for those. Uh, another interesting question from Ija. Sensitivity and specificity is the traditional gold standard for evaluating digital tools. However, Kate, and I have to agree with this, very effectively illustrated that visualization can show the additional benefits of real-world evidence. I really like the uh, spiral uh, diagram there, Kate. Uh, is there a way to quantify that extra benefit of RWE so it's more easily digested by industry? I think uh, I just wondering whether or not the visualization in itself can be seen as a value-added uh, provision. So uh, any comment on that? So I can jump in. Um, so, so I agree that the visual, the visualization is, is, is value add in and of itself, but I do believe that um, when we start to look at these continuous data and we look at day-to-day -day and within-day variability and patterns in behavior or patterns in physiological signals, we need to develop the most appropriate methods to analyze um, these data and to summarize these data. Um, and I don't think that those methods necessarily exist yet um, for all measurements, and I think that's a task for us um, on this panel, on this webinar today, to identify the most appropriate ways um, to use those data. I mean, we often collect continuous data, but we distill them down to summary metrics of, for example, average steps per day, when there's much more information in the signal, but we don't, as a group, know how to express um, this variability or patterns of behavior and those sorts of things. Thank you. Anyone else on that one or should we move on? Okay, uh, no, I'll think... move on. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> go for it. A comment, this is where Ray was commenting earlier that doing those studies early on um, as you look at those early phase trials is where you start to really define what those endpoints are you want to look at. And so you don't end up just going, okay, looking at average step count, et cetera. You, you're able to pull out. So then you can take that into the later phase trials and you understand exactly what you're looking for and the benefit, how accurate it is. And, and so it's a combination of all of that. Okay, well, Eric Kloss, one of and our listeners, says uh, you hit the nail on the head. How you translate uh, RW into action for the patient, for the provider, for the pharma company, data visualization points to the relevant action for each target. So very much in agreement with you there. Sorry, I was interrupting somebody. I was just going to um, echo the sentiment of um, these early phase pilot studies to inform the later phase, later phase bigger trials. I think that we can't underestimate um, the value of collecting these small data sets and understanding in this specific clinical group that we're interested in, what's the distribution of the data? Um, what's the spread of the data? How do they look like in this specific clinical group? Because most likely this measurement that we're doing is going to be, at this stage of the game, has never been done on the group clinical population that we're interested in. So being able to use those data to power um, later uh, trials and bigger trials, and as Carrie said, to identify the most relevant endpoints and the most relevant metrics, um, I, I think can't be underestimated. Thank you. Okay, we're fast running out of time, only four minutes left. I'm going to come to a couple more audience questions, but at the same time, I'm going to put another question up on your screen in the background. In fact, I'm going to do a couple more. So have a look at this. Will we invest in finding new endpoints which can be measured digitally, or are we digitally re replacing standard endpoints? Are we effectively finding new ones or replacing existing ones? Very keen to hear where you think the priority is going to be over the coming, let's say, 18 to 24 months. We'll put a time, time scale on that. Uh, okay, so uh, while you answer that, um, just go to a couple more audience questions I'd love the panel to come in on. Um, what about the integration of triggers ascertained via sensors that cause symptoms with the drugs that are prescribed? I don't know how common that is. Uh, when is the best time during development to approach the FDA to discuss the use of a digital endpoint rather than a precedented but antiquated scale? 
Um, having the ability to collect RW as well as having the ability to utilize wearable devices uh, uh, as well as have access on a daily basis of outcome metrics, should we create or have or work on a standardized industry composite endpoint to determine efficacy in real time during the clinical trial, trial instead of limited desirable endpoints? Uh, that was from Vera. So a few there. Um, not sure if you caught all of those, but would love for some audience comments. And thank you to the 53% of you who voted. I'm going to close that one while we while we talk. Anyone want to come in on those questions? Silence. Okay, uh, maybe that was well, too actually, much. Uh, I'll happy to to elaborate. Uh, we we are not well. We are in close dialogue with FDA, but but uh, in terms of that, we are a Danish company from Leo. Um, we are in close dialogue with, with, with the regulatory affairs in, in Denmark and obviously right now we are running a, a project, innovation project uh, funded by the government and obviously to write a protocol I think it's crucial that we involve the regulatory bodies to actually ensure that we do not get delayed because it's rejected, you know. Uh, so to have them close in the dialogue and say okay we need to move into a digital fair, uh, I, I really believe that it's crucial. So, uh, so. Thanks. And uh, do you find that uh, you know, regulators, maybe not just the FDA, are being open and accepting uh, in general? I realize that's a, a very uh, nuanced question that could, could have multiple yeah. dimensions to it, but keen to hear some opinions. Yeah. To, 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 to be honest, when I started, uh, I thought they would be very, very conservative. But what we have actually realized, they are very keen to learn more and they are very proactive. Obviously, they need to take care of that is never dangerous to participate in a clinical trial, but they are eager to learn more. And uh, I really believe that we have a very, very good and positive dialogue with them. Thanks. I'm going to put one final question up on the uh, screen just as we as we close out. So it uh, uh, be, be interesting to hear what people's opinion are. Uh, but any other comments on the, on the previous questions? I, I think just on the, la the last one, again, I would have uh, your audience again consider measuring what's been unmeasurable. You know, for depression, do we really think that the best way to be measuring depression is to create a digital tool that measures these rating scales? You know, I think it's far more valuable to measure how much time people spend al alone or how much time people spend outside their home or how active they are or, you know, how much they speak or what their voice is. I think those are all vastly more important uh, measures of how people feel, function, or survive than having uh, digital uh, rating scales uh, that seek to replicate what we currently measure really poorly. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm really sorry, but we've actually hit the hour. We are out of time. I feel like we really uh, could spend at least another couple more hours on this on this topic. I'll just close out this uh, survey. I can see that most of you have actually voted, so thank you for doing that. And uh, we'll just have a quick look at those results as well. Uh, as you can see, um, a, a fairly interesting spread. Um, it's not quite as polarized as we as I might have expected. Um, uh, Kate, do you want to have a final 10-second word on this? As I know, it's something that we talked about a lot, of, a lot just before the webinar. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this question is one of the epitomes of, well, it, it depends. <laughs> um, what we're trying to measure in those sorts of things. Um, but I do think at this stage of the game, as I've kind of said, related to the high quality, smaller data sets of labeled with ground truth data, I think having these validated, calibrated specialist devices at this stage of the game, I think those sorts of tools are really provided with some strong um, data moving forward. Thank you. Um, I'm so sorry that we've run out of time. There's a few audience questions that I'm not going to get a, a chance to address either. Perhaps we can do so offline afterwards somehow. Um, I do just want to take a moment to say a huge thank you, of course, to the five people on the on the list here um, who, who have graciously given up their time and energy. Particular thanks to Kate and Viva Sense for uh, her work in making sure that uh, today's session happened and being a great partner, as I said before. Do check out the uh, VivaSense site and learn a little bit more if you can. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I personally think it's been a really interesting uh, discussion. I can see a lot of you uh, online also saying that you've really enjoyed it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm going to hold open the uh, 
questions box for a couple more minutes just um, to allow you guys um, to suggest anything else. What would you like to hear from us next time? Uh, what in particular was, was useful today? Uh, have you got any thanks or further comments to make? Please do hold that open. Uh, uh, sorry, do please do uh, contribute before you disappear. Um, of course, a couple of people mentioned our Barcelona conference, um, which you can see pictured on the screen now. Do please join us in Barcelona uh, at the end of March or in Philadelphia in the middle of April if you are interested in this discussion. We are holding a digital trials conference, and it is free if you are a biopharma executive to attend. You may not have realized that. The rest of the conference is not free, but the, uh, uh, this new part that we're focusing on here, digital trials, where we're going to be talking about this topic a lot more, is free. Uh, so do please come along and be a part of that. It's going to be very exciting. You can also do the same in Philadelphia, as I mentioned. Uh, once again, huge thanks. Do send through your uh, suggestions for the future. Obviously, really keen to advance our industry on this front. It's absolutely vital that we make progress here uh, and uh, be, uh, keep this conversation alive. Thank you so much again to our panelists for enabling just that today. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. And we'll be back with you very shortly. Bye-bye.